this patient becomes comatose. Remember, however, that cerebellar lesions, patients respond differently to them. Here is a tumor that is slow growing. It is causing compression of the brainstem. However, this patient doesn't have to be comatose because they have accommodated to what's happening. While it's very different than somebody who comes in with an acute intracerebral hemorrhage and has compression, that patient will be comatose. So talking a little bit about diffuse neuronal dysfunction. Here are all the etiologies for reasons why a patient can have coma in this setting. I'll take a minute to talk about sepsis because that's something you all commonly see. And sepsis-associated encephalopathy or sepsis-associated dysfunction slash delirium is an acute condition and has been reported in up to 76% of patients with sepsis. And it could be secondary to microcirculatory dysfunction in the brain when there's insufficient blood supply. And in these patients, uh, people have looked at as S100B and neuron-specific analase and it noted that it's significantly higher in patients with sepsis-associated encephalopathy than in those that don't have it. And what essentially it is alluding to is the fact that there's neuronal and glial injury as a result of hyperperfusion, hypoperfusion, that's occurring in sepsis. There's impaired cerebral autoregulation up to, in up to 60% of patients at days one to four. So those patients that have sepsis-associated encephalopathy will have a higher in-hospital mortality rate than in patients who do not have the encephalopathy. Whichever the case be, sepsis survivors have long-term cognitive impairment, lower quality of life, and structural brain lesions that include involvement of the hippocampus, white matter disease, and ischemic strokes. So remember that patients with sepsis can have brain injury, and you may or may not be able to do something about it, but it's particularly important to pay attention to where you're maintaining their blood pressures. So the sepsis guidelines have changed as of 2016, and they included the Q sofa. And what is it? It is a way to identify patients who are at risk for not doing so well in the setting of sepsis, and that includes altered mental status now. So if you have a patient who has altered mental status, a fast respiratory state, and lower blood pressure, then remember these are patients that perhaps need to go and make it to the ICU so that the care can be more aggressive and the blood pressure can be managed uh, slightly differently. Again, it still is a mean arterial pressure greater than 65. Metabolic encephalopathies are also quite common. Again, it's a state of uh, cerebral dysfunction. It's a global cerebral dis dysfunction as a result of systemic stress. And it varies. You can have mild presentation of this, or you can have a deep coma. If a mild presentation really uh, comes down to altered executive function. So the etiology is global cerebral edema or alterations in transmitted function. You can have accumulation of uncleared toxic metabolites. You can develop vasogenic edema as well as just global energy failure in the brain. Clinically, they may just have signs of inattention, myoclonus, and confusion. However, establishing the presence of meta me uh, metabolic encephalopathy as opposed to some form of a dementing process is particularly important. So it's really the history that's going to help you determine is this truly a metabolic encephalopathy or are these patients who have an underlying dementing process? Because if it's a dementing process with secondary deterioration, they're not going to fare as well as somebody with a metabolic encephalopathy. Just a few slides on hepatic encephalopathy. A acute liver failure and fulminant hepatic failure are both defined by the new onset of hepatocellular dysfunction as reflected by a coagulopathy, which is an INR greater than 1.5, and an encephalopathy in the absence of pre-existing liver disease. And what it really comes down to is ammonia-induced neurotoxicity because it leads to astro astrocyte swelling and dysfunction. These are just some common causes of acute liver failure. I'm not going to belabor it. Uh, but I'm going to rather focus on the fact that there's a grading system for this encephalopathy. So in hepatic encephalopathy, grades three and four, you're going to find your patients are stuporous or comatose. And these are the patients who are going to fare poorly because they can have elevated intracranial pressure in up to 95% of pa patients with grades three and four encephalopathy. So in these patients, and what I'm about to say I know is controversial, ICP monitoring should be considered. 
but it depends on which country you're living in and which state you're practicing in. Because not everybody in the world of hepatic encephalopathy believes that ICP monitoring should occur. So I want to put it out there that your practice is as good as mine. So there are no randomized trials that support the use of ICP monitoring in these patients. However, the US Acute Liver Failure Study Group does recommend monitoring in grade three and grade four hepatic encephalopathy. Remember, though, that many of these patients have a severe underlying coagulopathy, and these have to be corrected before ICP monitor uh, placement, because otherwise you can end up with a massive hemorrhage, and that is the end of the story for that patient. What you're going to see in patients in an MRI uh, with hepatic encephalopathy is these globus, and I don't think it projects really well, but the globus pallidus is dark, and it is as a result of deposition of manganese in the globus pallidus. And this just helps you kind of confirm that that's what you're looking at. On EEG, if you were to do EEG on these encephalopathy patients, you're going to see triphasic waves. And what this triphasic waves is really is an upswing, a downswing, and another upswing, a bit like a VTAC perhaps. But that's on an EEG, not on an EKG. And usually when we do EEGs on these comatose patients and it comes back uh, with triphasic waves and we weren't thinking that it's an, uh, some sort of a metabolic encephalopathy, this absolutely triggers us to go down that pathway. Um, if you were to do hepatic, uh, sorry, evoke potentials in patients with hepatic encephalopathy, you will find absent, uh, absence of median, sense, uh, uh, median waveforms in, in SSCPs. And you can, this can help differentiate those patients whose clinical outcome is poor. So the moment their SSCPs start to drop off or the somatosensory evoked potentials start to drop off, perhaps these patients are not going to do well. For uremic encephalopathy, uh, going back as far as the first century, there has been description of what it is. They are pale, inert, sluggish, without appetite. They just look kind of swollen in, in dropsical. And you can get florid neuropsychiatric illnesses, and it can be subtle, going all the way again up to coma. However, myoclonus is much more prominent in patients with uremia, and you can get tetany as a result of abnormal calcium hemostasis. Uh, uremic coma can also be present. However, we don't see that anymore because of the more aggressive hemodialysis and removal of the toxins. In the past, it used to be a thing. And it is related to the accumulation of toxic compounds and not one single substance is believed to be the sole cause. And the treatment does involve correcting the metabolic disturbance and dialysis or renal transplantation is the way to go with these patients, though dialysis does correct this in a much more smoother form. We don't see the dialysis disequilibrium anymore. I actually did not include a slide about it for that particular reason. Uh, but these patients do recover from this encephalopathy. So if this is the cause of the coma, these patients actually uh, fare uh, quite well. Uh, stepping on to herniation syndromes. Uh, herniation is when pressure forces brain tissue to shift out of one compartment over to the other compartment. And again, it is, the in, it is the involvement of the reticular activating system that causes these patients to be comatose. And remember that herniation doesn't follow a single line of force. It's not just a transverse shift, but it is a transverse and a downward shift. And it may originally just be shifting laterally and then laterally and downward. However, it's the lateral tissue displacement that's more closely related to the level of consciousness, and this is a paper looking at just that. If you have a shift of about three millimeters from the midline, the patient can remain awake and alert, but as the shift continues to get worse, especially when it starts to hit about a centimeter of shift, these are patients who are comatose. Now, the only caveat that I want to put into this particular slide is the fact that not every brain is the same. The older the patient, the more atrophied the brain, they can tolerate much more significant shifts and sit there and talk to you. We see patients coming in with large subdurals who are in their 80s who are asking us, when can I go home now? When are you going to feed me? Which is very, very different from your 40-year-old that has about, I don't know, eight millimeters of shift and are completely comatose. So every brain, brain di behaves differently, but in general, this is the, the rule for behavior. 
So the original publication about prognosis and non-traumatic coma came out in 1981, this, uh, this uh, publication by Levy. And this is the original cardiac arrest outcomes hypothermia was based off of this paper. And they looked at uh, about 500 patients in non-traumatic coma, and um, the diagnosis included subarachnoid hemorrhage, ischemic stroke, hepatic encephalopathy, hypoxic ischemic um, injury. And what they found is that if any of the brainstem reflexes, which in their case was corneal and pupillary and oculovestibular, if there were any two that were not reactive, then if you go all the way down here, outcomes were really poor. 97% of these patients did not survive. So this is a more updated look at prognosis in patients with non-traumatic coma, uh, published out of Sweden. And again, over here, they looked at patients that came with all causes. And I actually like this paper a lot because it actually split the patients up into the different reasons why they came in comatose and looked at not just one-year mortality. They talked about hospital mortality as well as two-year mortality. And this slide covers the whole thing as best as we know outcomes in patients presenting with non-traumatic causes of coma. So if it was poisoning, that was the etiology, these people actually did really well. As opposed to patients presenting with malignancy and coma related to any etiology as a result of that widely spread malignancy, these, their outcomes were really poor. And following that was patients who had circulatory arrests. As you can see, only about 50% of patients did well at two years. And in between is everything else. So if you look at the slide, it tells you that metabolic seizures or poisoning as an etiology for a coma, patients actually fare really well in the long term. They are not just simply looking at the immediate outcome. They did it, they looked at up to two years. While if you have a circulatory arrest or infection, in our case, sepsis uh, or malignancy, patients did not fare well. So this is another publication by David Greer, who was one of my attendings a long time ago. Uh, and looking at outcome prediction in non-traumatic coma, they concluded that the neurological exam still has value. And this was patients who presented with neurological disease processes, and their outcomes were uh, defined as modified Rankin, um, which is what many of the publications are now using to define outcomes. And unfortunately, if modified Rankin 6 is death and mod modified Rankin 5 is severe disability, a good chunk of patients fell into this modified Rankin. So then how do you prognosticate, especially in this era of cardiac arrest followed by hypothermia? And this is becoming more and more a complex situation because patients coming in with all kinds of cardiac arrest, even though the cardiac arrest uh, hypothermia really only looked at VFib, malignant VFib, VTAC, we also cool patients in PE arrest. Uh, we don't restrict our cooling protocols to just VFib or VTAC. So how do you prognosticate how these patients are going to fare after hypothermia? Because the issue with hypothermia is that it can cloud the neurological exam and the picture. And targeted temper temperature management, which is the most recent guideline that we all follow, where patients are being cooled either to the 30, 32 to 34 or to 36 because outcomes are the same, irrespective of which one you choose, though there are different beliefs on whether it should be 32 or whether it should be 36. I'm not here to negotiate those discussions. Whichever you choose, it does impair the neurological exam, especially up front. And not only are we cooling for the first 24 hours, at least many of us are also continuing to maintain normal thermia for 72 hours post-cooling, because is it really the hypothermia or is it really the control of temperature that is improving outcomes in these patients? So what Otto's paper suggests is that it should be a multimodal approach to prognostication after coma. And the key modalities include neurological exam, in particular of brainstem reflexes. You should do some form of electrophysiological assessment and use EEG and SSEP. And if 
within, and, and these all should only happen after the first 72 hours. Do not prognosticate before 72 hours. But even in patients after 72 hours, because there are um, single studies and, and case series that have come out or, or single um, individual stories about how patients woke up even if they had no exam up to seven, uh, seven days. So then what do you really have to do at that point? So the first steps for patient assessment must include a Glasgow coma scale, especially the motor exam. You have to look at the brainstem reflexes, especially corneal and pupillary reflexes. A motor exam of less than two at 72 hours after cardiac arrest has a reduced accuracy just because the patient is not moving at 72 hours after cardiac arrest it does not help you prognosticate that this patient is not doing well, or it's not going to do well, should I say. However, both corneal and pupillary light reflexes have pretty good accuracy. So if you have a patient who's not got any motor function at 72 hours, and have absent corneals, and have absent pupillary light reflexes, then there's a likelihood that these patients are not going to do well. But 72 hours still is not time enough for you to prognosticate. Uh, I just went through this about the fact that you need to have the absent motor and the absent beta reflexes. However, what's gaining more and more popularity, at least in my world, is the quantitative pupillary light reflex. So I don't know how familiar uh, or how often you, you all use pupillometry, but it is a really sensitive way of looking to see if the pupils are reactive or not. Because just by shining a light, you don't often see while the pupillometer will actually measure the light reflex for you. And, it, uh, and the recommendation is that it should perhaps be standard of care that you're using pupillometry uh, for um, um, uh, coma prognostication. Now EEG, in patients who are comatose, up to 30% uh, of these patients after cardiac arrest could actually be in status. And my clonic status epilepticus, which in the past had a bad, was a bad prognostic indicator, is no longer a bad prognostic indicator. You can treat my clonic status, and these patients actually recover from the myoclonic status and do fairly well. However, remember that it, prognosis in general may not always be very good. So then how do you tell if these people are going to recover or not based on EEG? So it's looking at the background activity. So if their background activity re reacts to any sort of stimulation, and you don't need continuous EEG for this because I realize that not everyone is capable of doing a con continuous EEG monitoring, but even just doing a spot EEG where you're checking them for background reactivity, which is you know clapping your hand or calling out their name or even a painful stimuli, here's, here's one where nothing changes in the background, right? But over here, the background picks up the moment you stimulate them. So that is someone who's reacting to the stimulation that you have given. So these are the patients who are actually going to have better outcomes. These patients have poor outcomes. So what this paper is concluding is that continuous EEG monitoring does, can help you because A, it helps you pick up uh, if they're in status or seizures because those can be treated. And if they have a non-reactive EEG, then the prognostication is pretty poor for these patients. Moving on to somatosensory evoke potentials, in particular the N20 response uh, from the primary somatosensory co cortex is the most accurate is the most accurate predictor of poor, poor prognosis. And if you have bilateral absence of the N20 response, it is almost 100 percent predictive of a poor prognosis. Uh, and this is what the N20 response should look like, and this is when you don't have it. Now to confuse matters, does hypothermia influence, uh, in, influence the predictive value of bilateral apps and N20 response after cardiac arrest? Yes, it does. So again, the timing of doing the SSCP is particularly important. You want to wait at least 72 hours after rewarming before you assess them with an SSCP. So I think to, to make myself clear, what I'm repeatedly saying is everything should at least wait for 72 hours and perhaps even for a whole week before you truly prognosticate because you want to have the effect of hypothermia or any medications that you have these patients on while you're cooling them to be completely out of the system before you move on to prognostication. <laughs>
Uh, neuron specific analase, or NSE, is the best studied and the only biomarker that is recommended in the international guidelines. Um, and in a sub-study of the targeted temperature management, uh, when they had patients who had NSE values greater than 40 to 50 milligrams per milliliter, in the 48 to 72 hour uh, period, uh, they actually had fewer false positive rates for predicting poor outcome. That means if you had high neuron-specific NLAs at 48 or 72 hours and they repeated the neuron-specific NLAs or the NSE on a daily basis to assess whether these levels were high and if they stayed high, then it, it is a poor prognostic uh, indicator because temperature does not have any effect or cooling does not have any effect on NSE levels. Um, brain CT. And again, there's a lot of controversy about it because when somebody arrests, do you get a brain CT? Does the brain CT help you in any way at the time or right after the arrest? I say the answer is yes, but that's my personal opinion. Because if it is a neurological etiology for that arrest, you kind of know then that these people are not going to do well. Uh, or if there's something that needs to be treated from a neurological perspective, you know what it is that you're supposed to treat. But in terms of prognosticating in the first 24 hours, even if they have had prolonged cardiac arrest or hypoxia, it doesn't necessarily help you because they could have pretty severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and your CT is normal. So in the first 24 hours, the CT doesn't necessarily help you prognosticate how these patients have fared from the hypoxic event in itself. It usually takes about 24 hours for the CTs to start showing changes of um, uh, ischemia, oh, sorry, of uh, hypoxia. Uh, with regards to MRI, uh, when you're looking at the MRI, you're, getting, you're looking at the diffusion, which is what is showing you the infarcts if they are present. But this particular study uh, looked at not just the diffusion, but also the ADC map, the ADC or the apparent diffusion coefficient should show darkness to all of the areas that are infracted or bright on the diffusion. And I, and I hope this shows. So here's all the diffusion brightness that you're looking at, right? And so you would think that this is a brain that has got pretty severe anoxic brain injury because it looks like quite a significant portion of that brain is involved. However, when you look at the ADC map, the two true infracted areas only back here. It's only the parietal occipital region that seems to be infarcted. So it isn't enough to really just look at the diffusion. You also have to look at the ADC map because the ADC maps, and there's algorithmic ways to calculate that. that I, I don't know anything about it. It's, it's done at, uh, at the MRI level, not at my level. Um, that can tell you whether how much of the brain is involved, and if, if only on ADC map, if a significant portion of the brain is involved, is this MRI helpful in prognostication? So to conclude, you have a patient uh, who has had a cardiac arrest. You cool them in the first um, 24 hours. You rewarm them. It usually takes another 12 hours or longer to rewarm them. And then for us, we maintain normothermia, which adds another three more days because we maintain normothermia for 72 hours after rewarming. And only then should we truly be looking at prognostication. You have to exclude confounders, particularly if there's any residual sedation. If the patient has no motor exam at greater than 72 hours after return of spontaneous circulation, look at the brainstem reflexes. If you have absent pupillary and corneal reflexes and bilaterally absent SSCPs, SSCPs are the first things that we go towards, then the likelihood that these patients will have any, any positive outcome is very low. And the false positive rate on that prognostication is the less than 5%. If you have brainstem reflexes or the SSCPs are in, inconclusive, then wait. Give it another 24 hours. And if they have status, treat it. If they have high neuron-specific analase, make sure that it's staying high. If the EEG is showing birth suppression on, or lack of reactivity to stimulation, and you have diffuse anoxic brain injury on the MRI, as correlated with your apparent diffusion or the ADC map, then more than likely the outcome is poor. If, the, if, it, the, if all of these are indeterminate, give it some more time because you'll be surprised. A lot of these patients do wake up. They may have cognitive impairment. You know they don't have cognitive impairment. They're probably not going to be the people they were before they came in 
So ongoing discussions with families up front about the fact that cognitive impairment is perhaps a given in these patients is also particularly important. But the key thing is to use multimodal prognostication wherever possible. And if you don't have any of this technology available, give it seven days and see what the patient is doing. Your neuro exam for sure is something you can follow for those seven days. And if they are still comatose, have no exam, and everything else confounding has been taken out of the equation, then more than likely they're never going to wake up. So that's my talk. Thank you so much.